My name is Katarina Ang Berza from the Council for Health and Development here in the Philippines. I'm Dr. Joshin Pedro from the Council for Health and Development, a member of the People's Health Movement Philippines. My name is Sharao Ome. I'm uh, working at the Health Work Committee in Palestine. Uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward you know, to our discussion um, and our um, insights, sharing our insights and our experiences uh, towards strengthening our solidarity. Our organization is uh, working since uh, 1984. Uh, we, we work in health and development. And I am happy to be part of this discussion regarding the privatization of health and the Filipino people's struggle for a free, comprehensive, and progressive health care system. Hello. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Happy coffee. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Uh, so thanks for giving us space to know each other and uh, to know about each other um, with more specific and also to uh, uh, expose our experience to, to the IBHU in uh, Europe. And we are ready for uh, sharing uh, the information as much as uh, we can that could be helpful for our other activists in the in the world you know in uh, palestine uh, before uh, the Palestinian authority came in 1994 according to oslo accord uh, all the health services were uh, was under the military uh, uh, order of uh, the Israeli occupation. So there is uh, no uh, investment in the healthcare system of Palestinian of the for Palestinian. Uh, the budget uh, between uh, for the last three years uh, it's around ten and eleven percent of the total uh, budget for uh, uh, for uh, Palestine in general, which is uh, considered to be. Um, acceptable in terms of uh, budget because the WHO uh, consider at least at least the budget of the Ministry of Health it should be nine something like this so we are a little bit near the number but the, the most important is not the percent it, it is how it is uh, invested how it is distributed for us uh, the quality of work in the public sector, uh, sectors they are not at um, uh, um, uh, and that much very acceptable. Even we have uh, very good doctors, we have very good, uh, we have equipment, but the shortage of staff, shortage, shortage of nurses, shortage of uh, midwife make the condition difficult. Uh, we don't uh, have universal coverage uh, for the primary health, even the primary health care. Uh, one third of my people in Palestine, they do not have any kind of insurance. Philippines, uh, we have a mixed um, a mixed health system. So we have a public sector and a private sector. And the only thing bridging the two are is the uh, is the national health insurance. So in the Philippines, um, despite having the public and the private sectors, the amount of hospitals between the two sectors is um, there is a big disparity. So for example, in the Philippines, you have um, one third of your hospitals are public and two thirds are private. We have a very expensive um, healthcare system. Uh, a lot of, um, still around half of all uh, health expenses come from out of pocket of uh, every individual. So despite having a health insurance uh, for, the, uh, for every Filipino, we are only starting to implement some sort of universal healthcare system. We still have um, public hospitals that are not being funded properly you know, because the state should be funding these uh, public hospitals properly. But because of um, budgetary constraints in which the Philippines is not really uh, prioritizing uh, the funding of its public hospitals, especially for its maintenance and other operating expenses. And this drives public hospitals to raise rates for for laboratories and diagnostic procedures so it, it causes um, public hospitals to generate their own in, their own income because they cannot rely on the budget and that leads to um, these uh, public private partnerships as well as other um, privatizing measures so that they will be able to become economically self-sufficient 
to uh, to counter the fact that they are not being funded well enough. Since the university days, I have been an activist, uh, an organizer as a student, but it was that moment in 2013 when we went to the Philippine Orthopedic Center and uh, there was the campaign against the privatization of or the sale of that uh, premier bone hospital in the Philippines. So it was up for sale and patients, relatives, health workers, health advocates were campaigning against it because when you lose a big public hospital to the hands of the private companies, where will the poor go? So it just follows that later on the hospital will be uh, forced to generate income and charge the patients with fees that they can hardly afford. Patients started talking about it at first. The health workers started talking about it because it would also directly affect them because there was no guarantee that when the private corporation buys out this public hospital, all of them would be retained in their current position. Uh, I remember as a medical student, I was also part of that. Modernized, no? that is the term that the, uh, that the Philippine government uses with regards to uh, the hospitals. So they were going to be modernized and this, they were going to be mad. Uh, that is what basically one of the models that the, the Philippine government has done for a lot of hospitals. And I remember as a medical student, that was uh, something that we took shifts actually to help um, uh, the the strikes as well as the mobilizations outside you know, the gates of the hospital and then we were trying to uh, prevent the people from moving the equipment out of the hospital as well as the uh, those that were trying to enter the hospital and break up the the barricade or the the picket lines you know? and I remember uh, one of those last nights we were there um, taking uh, a vigil outside of the hospital and and it was really something uh, to behold no? especially it was a great opportunity for a medical student uh, to really see and to, so a lot of us were medical students who were there to see really uh, what is the impact no, of, of uh, these um, medical services that will be rendered um, inaccessible to a lot of our patients. No? So I remember being able to talk to patients there who were saying that that is the only place they could afford not to give birth in. The reality is that you know no mother should really die or no mother should really um, um, not have the economic ability to just deliver life you know, into the world. And that was really something that was um, striking, and especially as a medical student, you're being taught that this is the basics for obstetrics and gynecology. This is the minimum or the bare standards. And sometimes uh, a lot of mothers in the Philippines are not uh, getting that care. Um, that really was something uh, to believe in. And uh, we see that, that the effects of that, no, even up to today, are still really strong. And then we, that hospital still exists. It remains to be public. And um, mothers are still availing of those services free of charge. Always uh, when uh, people insist on their right, they uh, will win. Always uh, the future is for people and for the rights. I mean, this is very inspiring for us also. Um, uh, I would like uh, to, uh, to talk a little bit about very recent experience. Uh, there is uh, different, uh, um, you know, campaigns we did uh, and before, like one related to the medication of our chronic disease, but uh, the, the most recent one and very inspiring one, and because uh, it came from uh, the people themselves, uh, for the people with disability, 80% of the services provided for uh, people with disability is provided by NGOs, mainly the health and development and so on. And the, always the government, they don't want to go to this um, field. Uh, uh, they decide to do a strike in the middle of a Palestinian Legislative Council. They stay 60 days, day and night, they sleep. They start with five group, five people, from people with disability themselves, they start in, in this strike and to talk about their needs. And uh, we as a health sector, as NGO, from the first day, we start to support them. And we start to 
bring people. We talk to the media. We talk to the government. And uh, we bring people from all over West Bank with, and mobilize the human rights organization. We mobilize the coalition, the networks working with women, uh, with women issue for, uh, for violence. Uh, we, uh, we mobilize the NGO sector working with agriculture. We mobilize the coalitions working with education. So, and uh, the media people. So when all the sectors, all networks, all, uh, all the union came and support them, uh, after 60 days, the prime minister, he sent his delegation, the minister of health, they sent his delegation and they sit and discuss what they want. And now uh, they reach uh, the agreement that they will uh, uh, accept all their requirements. And uh, I mean, this is uh, the strong of uh, movements. It's like, it is a social movement for, uh, for disability and all people they supported. Uh, but really it started by five people. Uh, we bring a lot of people. We, we mobilize many organizations to support them. And I guess uh, this is a very strong success story because it will start from the people themselves and uh, with the people and for people. I think learning to become an activist takes a lifetime, you know. Um, we cannot learn activism or how to wage a struggle or a campaign through books or any reading materials. I think we learn the struggle and campaign for a better world when we live among the people. Um, we cannot, there is no template in waging a struggle or in waging a campaign. There's no template on how to become a good activist. We learn that through time, and uh, we learn that through exchanges, through stories among colleagues, among comrades. Um, we learn through experiences, and most especially, we learn with the people. So what we know, what we read, we, we share them with the people, and the people whom we struggle along with, they share their experiences and struggles with us. And through that, we also learn. So it is really a continuum. It is a lifetime of learning on how to wage these things. Maybe one thing that in my experience as an activist, uh, even as a student, that's something that you, you learn to do. I mean, that's not something that, that's taught in school. Um, perhaps uh, my experience as a as a beginning medical student, and then later on as I committed to be part of an of an NGO and the in a larger uh, health movement, it's really um, having that sense of uh, of injustice and realizing really uh, even if things seem okay, even if things seems you know it's the way it's always been. If you realize that that it is inherently wrong or there is really a problem. Um, that's a big part of, of health activism is being able to unravel through with unravel all the uh, societal um, normality, that, that sense of normalcy, you know, that, that to really um, unearth you know, all the, all the uh, inequity and the injustices that we are seeing. Um, as a medical student, one of the, one of the um, exposures I had was to a indigenous community. Uh, I went to an indigenous community um, during my elective rotation when I was a fourth year medical student, um, also in a community-based health program. And that is, why, that is when I was first um, really uh, exposed to the work that, that the organization I belong to now um, has been doing. So I went to some of the mountainous um, indigenous communities and, and I saw uh, some children where um, they were really stunted. They were there a lot of uh, health conditions and it was seen to be normal. It, it is the way it has always been that there are children who do not reach the age of two because of how bad um, under five mortality was to the point that some children uh, were no, no longer being named by their parents. 
Uh, so they wouldn't be given a name until they reach around two years old because that is the only time in which they would actually be assured of their survival. So some uh, cultural um, uh, approaches was for, for some, uh, some communities and some societies to really just uh, accept the fact that there will be some children who will not make it out of um, their infancy. And thus, um, what is the sense of giving them a name that you would have an emotional connection with? So um, seeing these things, you know, for for a lot of them, it was it was normal. It was the way it's always been. And you know, when when that when that in when the health system encounters that, you know, what are you supposed to think about that? That uh, is this normal? Is this something that that is reflective of how bad the health access is? And it has to be remedied. No? And that's something that we as, as health workers really have to, to understand and, and really break through all those normalcy in society and the, the lack of solidarity. And you know, that we must be really living the lives and, and going to the marginalized to really understand what, uh, what they need in terms of health care and really asserting what the right to health really means, especially for the poorest of the poor. Activism is not a career, it is not a profession. It is, it is life, it is the kind of life that you choose. That is why uh, in the Philippines, we always say that activism is not a 9 to 5 job. It's at 9, 9 a.m. in the morning up to 5 p.m. in the afternoon, you are an activist. After that, you can do whatever you want. But uh, for us here who are struggling, the poor, are struggling 24-7. Uh, poverty knows no time, knows no place. So that is why if we decide to become an activist and struggle for change for a brighter future, we should also be ready to undertake that kind of sacrifice. Sometimes uh, even for the likes of Dr. Joshua, who, who has shunned private practice and he chose to work with the community-based health programs in the Philippines where uh, the pastures are not greener and we have very limited resources here. So sometimes even um, letting go of your personal or own ambitions, uh, activism is really a kind of life that you choose not only for yourself, but it is like an offering that you make for the people. Uh, I really, uh, I learned from Catherine and just about what they say uh, they touch the heart uh, on that. Uh, but um, I agree totally that uh, the secret of that, first, you should be a believer. I mean, you should believe uh, on the issue of people. Um, uh, if you are not a believer, you will not win, or you'll not get, you can't be an activist. So you should be, believe on, on a, a specific issue, like you should believe with, uh, uh, about the uh, People who are suffering from poverty, you should believe about women rights. You should be a believer about people with disability rights. You should be a believer uh, that all about humanity, uh, about uh, free, uh, free uh, freedom. So, if you are not believer on that, you will not be an activist. So, this is first. Second, you should listen to people, and listen to people. That mean mean. Uh, be with people, as Catherine uh, said. I mean, uh, uh, there is a lot of rich learning from the experience of people. It's not something written in books or uh, on things, but you should believe on change. And uh, you should be ambitious. You should have a dream. Because if you don't have a dream, if you don't have the hope, if you don't believe of yourself as a change agent, you will not be an activist. And the fourth thing, you should be a risk taker. There is a risk in, in being an activist, a risk for many things, as uh, uh, the colleague. There, there is, you know, if, they, if he preferred to go to private sector, he would be a very rich man. But he, he want to go to, uh, to serve the people because he's a believer, because he is a risk taker, because he uh, recognized people um, against his interest or against his uh, 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 needs, for example. So if you, you should, uh, I mean, being an activist, you should be a risk taker. And there is a lot of pay of, of that um, 
for example, in Palestine, maybe the pay of you will go to the jail. If you want to talk about social rights, political rights, or you should be accused, you should be, it could, you, you, you be, be, maybe you'll be shooting. Uh, you don't know. There is a way of being an activist and uh, defenders of uh, people's uh, rights. And uh, the rights sometimes will not be uh, separated. All the rights, they are connected. They are one unit, political, uh, economical, social, uh, and uh, some rights uh, denied because of the political issues. And I hope we'll to see many activists of your because now we are becoming old. We need a new generation of youth and activists. Still, you are young, uh, Catherine, and uh, just for me, I'm around 60, so uh, soon or later, but uh, still, I have uh, energy to be an activist. <laughs> Dare to struggle, dare to win. The people united will never be defeated, especially with regards to health care and our right to health. Together as an activist toward right to health. Thank you very much, everyone. This is really very inspiring.